Hi and welcome to the Spooky House. My name is David Saunderson and today we're joined again by Dr Peter McHugh, a paranormal investigator, researcher and author uh, based in Scotland. How are you Peter? Not too bad, thank you very much indeed. Uh, today uh, you've asked to talk about the Balonic uh, poltergeist, which I believe is a, a, a poltergeist uh, case based in Glasgow and it's, it's, it's not really as well known as other poltergeist cases around the UK, but uh, you've, you've described it as being similar to the Enfield poltergeist in scope, but maybe just not as famous. That's correct, yes. Can you maybe give us a, a few details about this uh, case? Because we're, we're all obviously very interested in poltergeists and uh, especially ones that uh, seem to be right up there with the uh, a case such as uh, infamous as uh, the Enfield poltergeist. Yes, this was a case from the mid seventies. It, it, it ran from uh, 1974 into 1974 to 1975. Um, I'm I've looked a fairly detailed way at four sources um, for it. There are actually even more. Um, and um, they all uh, inevitably, when you're looking at different sources, they differ. Uh, one of the sources is a newspaper article written at the time. The people involved were actually named um, in the Glasgow Herald in, in January 1975. Uh, Another another source is a chapter in a book called A Sense of Something Strange by the late Professor Archie Roy. Archie Roy was an astronomer and also a psychical researcher based in Glasgow, um, an active researcher uh, involved in the Society for Psychical Research. He was president of it for some time. He was also prominent in the Scottish Society for Psychical Research. Now, in his book, book a sense of something strange which was published in 1990 archie roy changed the names of of, of most of the participants he said that admitted that in uh, the, the participants except for himself and another investigator called max mcgee a clergyman but what he didn't say um, was that he'd actually changed the location as well and he didn't say that was a deliberate change. Um, he, 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 it was just left as if it was a, a, a real location. He called it the Maxwell Park case. Now, unfortunately, there is actually in Glasgow a Maxwell Park. It's literally a park. It's not a housing scheme on the south side of Glasgow, which is rather different from the area where the the events actually occurred, Balornock, on the north side of Glasgow. So I think that's caused some confusion. And, and other people have perpetuated that sort of Maxwell Park uh, appellation. Anyway, the case uh, involved two or rather three families. Um, the... And I'm using real names here because they, they were in the public domain from January 1975, as I say. Um, the first family, uh, the Greaves, were living on the upper level of a two-storey council um, house, you know, two flats, um, one above the other in Northgate Quadrant, Balornock. And below them was a family called Keenan, the Keenans. The Keenans, there were three of them, a, 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 a husband, a wife, and a 30-year-old son. The Greaves family consisted of husband and wife, two sons aged initially at the time of the disturbances, I think about 14, I'll just check my notes here, yes, about 14 and 11, plus the, mo the mother of uh, Mrs. Greave, um, who actually, I think, was uh, that the property was in her name. So these two families lived one another uh, above one another or below from the point of view of the Keenans, and they didn't get on. They, there was some kind of conflict between them going back approximately 12 years, I think. And now I'm not sure of the, what the origin of that conflict was, but they didn't get on very well. Um, in, if you look at the Grieve family, and if you're looking for sort of psychological tensions and problems and so on, the the elder son, um, the 14-year-old Derek, was apparently unhappy at school. He hated school. He had few friends and was introverted. Um, and as I say, there was this conflict between the family below. The third family of, of, of significance here, and I'm not sure of the pronunciation here, but 
um, I'll, I'll, try, I'll make an attempt at it, the Brava. Um, Mrs. Greaves, uh, ha Mrs. Greaves had a sister, an older sister, who was married to a Dutchman who'd served in the, the Dutch resistance during the war. And they lived, the Brava family lived about three quarters of a mile away. And when the disturbances began, which I can go into more detail if you wish, mm. Um, mm. Th there was a point. There were there were points where the Greaves left their flat to get a bit of solace and went to the, the their relatives, the Bravas. But then the phenomena followed them uh, to the to that house. And indeed, the phenomena actually occurred at other locations as well, to a limited extent. One of the one of the children poltergeist phenomena occurred at his school um the elder of the of the two uh, grieve family children um went to the north of scotland to stay with some relatives for a period um and there were there were a few phenomena there uh there were some phenomena in his in, in his father's car as well so the, the phenomena were quite sort of distributed across a number of sites uh, and the case seemed to be a very person-centered one, although it wasn't terribly clear whether there was one focal person in this case or maybe several. Um, it's perhaps of significance, and I, I, I'm not trying to un, 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 unnecessarily complicate things, but when you take the Keenan family downstairs, um, Mr. The, the James Keenan was about 65 to 70, and he actually died, I think, in May of, of, of 1975 of lung cancer and it's been speculated that his illness probably developed the previous year you know in, in a sort of insidious way and then got worse mm. so it may have kind of the onset of the portuguese phenomena to some extent may have coincided with his terminal illness um, on the other hand, it could be said that the phenomena were related to tensions within the Gree family or the hatred between the two families um, so it's a complicated case, but it it's got many typical features. Okay, well, what what actually happened that uh, what you would describe as typical features of poltergeist that happened here? Well, sto the the accounts differ slightly. The, the The general consensus seems to be that the phenomena began around the or, or began on the third of November, nineteen seventy four. The boys in the Grieve family uh, uh, produced a, made a bonfire. And it's suggested that they either created an effigy of their neighbour, Mr. Um, uh, Mr. Keenan, or, or maybe just called the guy by his name. Uh, but that didn't go down well with the neighbours. And on that day, uh, supposedly, according to perhaps the majority of accounts, the phenomena began. But according to a psychiatrist called James McHarg, who visited the Greaves on three occasions, was, who had an interest in psychical phenomena, uh, the phenomena began as early as August or September of 1974 with auditory phenomena. But if you go with the main, the, 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 the main sort of I, the idea that they began in, in, in uh, November, the phenomena were initially uh, scratchings um and no knockings i think on the on, uh, near the bed of the of the the two boys um but soon the phenomena developed into object movements um and um i'm just looking at my notes here actually um yes phase one from the third of november to the fourth of december uh, earlier, according to James McHarg, um, tappings in the Greaves boys' bedrooms, banging and scratching sounds. Noises continued nightly, even even following um, when they slept in their parents' room. Um, the police were called several times. The two families tended to blame each other. <laughs> And eventually the Keenans, were, I gather, were arrested and taken to a local police station, although subsequently released. But they were being blamed for causing the disturbances. Lots of people became involved, police officers, um, council workers, others, GPs. Um, and people in the two locations, the downstairs flat and the upstairs flat, each thought that each set thought the sounds were coming from from the other location. Um but um, even when the uh, even when the Greaves weren't at their flat, when they were at the Bravas, uh, um, phenomena occurred there. They returned after vacating the flat at one point and found that um, the tap 
lights were, was, was turned on and there was flooding um and and a plumber came out dealt with that and uh um and, but then they had a, another problem with their tap later when they were at the bravas um object movements and even water uh, dripping from the which is a phenomenon that has been noted in other other poltergeist cases mm -hmm. um, the, the first phase, as I say, went on uh, for, for about a month. Um, and then the next phase, according to some of the accounts of this, this case, went on from the 6th of January to the 18th of January, 1975. Um, and it, it seemed to start with the Greaves watching a television report um, about a poltergeist case in Newcastle. Um and they, Mr. Greve, uh, 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 the, 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 the father, decided to, at least, decided to tape, do a tape-recorded recording of their, their recollections of what had happened to them. Now, whether it's coincidental or not, but that seemed to reawaken the phenomena, mm -hmm. um, which, which seemed to be quite, uh, quite bad. Um, there was a third phase um, of the phenomena. I should, I should perhaps say that the investigators became involved, including Archie Roy, including a clergyman called Max McGee, including another clergyman from the University of Glasgow. Um, ceremonies and rituals of sort of cleansing or, or, or exorcism were carried out um, uh, with, with some or, or, or some success, whether it be coincidental or not. A third phase is said to have run between the 3rd of February and the 23rd of May, during which the boys' bodies seem to be, among other things, contorted into horrible shapes. Um, and um, at one point, the Reverend uh, Max McGee, a colleague of Archie Roy's, shouted, this is ridiculous, stop it. And the phenomena did indeed stop temporarily. Um, the phenomena ceased approximately 48 hours a couple of days before mr keenan died of cancer as i say in, i think that was in may of 1975 um but there may have been some phenomena after that i'm not quite sure of the details i think i think there, there may have been some phenomena after that but i think they did peter out around the summer of 1975 or, or just a little later uh, I've, a possible factor may be that Derek Grieve, who was then 15, had left school, which he hated, and managed to secure a job as an apprentice electrician, which he'd been wanting to, to achieve that, that position. And then apparently after that, the phenomena were absent. Uh, were, were absent. So it went on over the best part of a year. Uh, lots of potential areas of psychological stress and conflict. Uh, hard to know who was the, you know, who caused the phenomenon, who didn't. Uh, the people who had health problems. I should say, in the Bravas family, the 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 um, Mr. Mr. Greaves' uh, uh, brother-in-law, the the sister of Mrs. Greave, uh, there was a daughter there who had health problems. She was she had a severe, I think, hearing impairment, a speech yeah. impediment. Well, it often appears in a lot of these cases that, uh, that lots of stress in a family. I mean, Enfield was a very stressed family. Yeah. Uh, do do you have a do you have your own theory about what causes poltergeist activity generally? Well. I, I, with regard to this case, um, Archie Roy and his colleague Max McGee, they, I think, reading between the lines of, of what uh, Archie Roy wrote about the case, I think they, they tended to think that it was family tensions, that uh, it probably was what parapsychologists sometimes call recurrent spontaneous um, psychokinesis, that, that, that if you've got certain psychological tensions, unconsciously people can... Um, display psychokinesis, a sort of mind over matter effect, mm -hmm. and it's not to do with spirits necessarily. However, during the the, the Bullorn case, Mr. Grieve in particular, at, 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 on, in the upper flat, um, up, they, they came to believe that it was spirits of dead miners. I think uh, using a, 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 um, 
a coding system with wraps an attempt was made by the family to communicate with the the entity or whatever it was and it, it declared itself to be dead miners who'd had an accident and there had apparently been mining works in that area um but as I say, Roy and his colleague thought it was probably underlying tensions. And my own view, I'm open minded, to be honest, I'm open minded. But I, I do I do wonder whether it's to, to a large extent, if not wholly, um, it, some kind of subconscious un tension which can translate itself in certain people, in certain circumstances, maybe with certain positive environmental factors as well into psychokinesis a kind of mind over matter effect however I, I wouldn't dismiss the possibility there could be some kind of external intelligence although i doubt whether it's spirits of the dead okay um, but you you were you were saying earlier when we were first we were first talking about this that uh the case was in a place called Balonek, but yes. it's referred to as Maxwell Park. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because I believe that's how Archie Roy reported it when he wrote it up. Yeah, well, this, this was this was strange in a way because the case had already been in the public domain. It had been mentioned in the Glasgow Herald in January uh, 1975. But when Archie Roy wrote it up in his book, A Sense of Something Strange, he, as I say, changed the names of most of the people involved. And he said he'd done that, but he didn't say he'd changed the location. And that has caused problems. I mean, other people have been reporting it as Maxwell Park. And the problem is, as I say, Maxwell Park is a very different area. It's it's a salubrious area on the south side of Glasgow, very middle class in appearance, wide streets, big stone houses. I mean, admittedly, some of them may have been broken down into flats now, but probably merchant type class people, you know, from years ago. Uh, the park itself is a park, you know, it's trees, grass, and flowers and that sort of thing. And it's not a housing scheme. So by, by describing it as Maxwell Park, it was a, a very misleading kind of description of it and, and completely unnecessary. I mean, I think if, if Archie Roy had felt that mentioning the location would have been prejudicial to the people who'd experienced the events, even though it had already been publicised in the paper at the time, even if he thought that, he could have simply withheld the name or just said, I'm describing a location in Glasgow, but I shan't go any further because I want to protect the identity of the those involved. But to actually kind of fictionalise it by giving a different name, and to be honest, it makes me wonder in 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 Archie Roy's writings whether he's done it elsewhere. You know whether whether you know you're reading something and you think you're reading about uh, you know Chelsea and, and it's really Whitechapel where it happened or something mm -hmm. like that. Oh, that's right. Do you, uh, what do you think the problems are of fictionalising an area, other than just not having the truth? Well, there could be environmental factors. Um, there was a case in Fife, a UFO case that I, I you know, I looked at the literature on a little while back, uh, from from some year, some years ago, and uh, uh, the, the the one of the investigators had re misreported the location to the press and said it occurred at a place called Kennaway. In fact, it seems that the principal events occurred near a hamlet called Newton of Falkland. And what's interesting about this is that just to the east of Newton of Falkland, where some of these alleged events occurred, there are power lines going straight across the road there. Now, I'm not saying that those power lines, uh, magnetic fields associated with them, necessarily played a role in the, in the experiences, but it's quite possible they did. Now, if you didn't know the location, and you didn't know there were power lines there, you, you, you're, you're being denied an important piece of potentially relevant inf information. So therefore, I think it's very important with haunting and poltergeist cases to know not just uh, what happened, but where. You know, you don't have to have maybe the the, the actual address. I mean, although I know that this case occurred in a Northgate Quadrant in Bologna, I don't actually know the number of the property, and I, I probably wouldn't mention that anyway. But uh, uh, but, but I, I I don't think it's necessary to start sort of lying about where things occur and i think it just it just turns the supposed reporting of paranormal phenomena into semi-fiction i suppose he must have had his reasons for doing that but it's uh well it's possible that he made a mistake he just didn't realize he'd done it but uh or it may be that he had a kind of silly assumption that that, that the area didn't matter but uh i i don't know but it's not just uh 
you know, I think it, it, it's something that should be discouraged. You know, silent pseudonymization, changing a name without saying. All you have to do is say um, John Smith brackets pseudonym or John Smith brackets, okay. not his real name. And then you're, you're taking away the element of a lie or deception. Or if yeah. you say it happened in um, Manchester brackets, not the true location, closed brackets, you're not lying. You may be yeah. withholding information, but you're not lying. But if you don't do that, um, you, you, you are bordering on telling lies. Mm. What do you what do you think the we'll just finish up with do we know the legacy of this uh poltergeist poltergeist case because obviously it's 45 years ago this all happened do we know anything about the what happened to this family well i i, I gather that for some time i think it was archie roy received po christmas cards from the greaves uh, I don't know how long it went on, but saying all's sort of clear or all's fine. Um, I don't know maybe whether it was a long period of time or just a few years. But the impression one gets from that is that um, it, 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 that was probably the end of it. Um, it's it's been my experience with other cases and cases one or two cases I've looked at you know where I followed them up or tried to follow it up over time and and you get that you know nothing to report sort of thing of over after a period of time things die down so my impression is that things have died down. Well, that that's good because as much as we're interested in these kind of cases, it can't be pleasant to be living through these things. No, it may be related to the age at which certain key individuals. Uh, and the tensions they're experiencing at the time, as you probably know, in poltergeist cases, it's often sort of suggested that people around the age of puberty or adolescence, young people, not always, but uh, uh, where there are psychological changes occurring related to maturational processes and so on, may, may be playing a role in, in what's happening. And in some mysterious way, these people are able to unconsciously release psychokinetic forces or catalyze phenomena in some way uh, uh, that wouldn't happen with someone of a different age group perhaps and not 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 with not with such a degree of frequency anyway no. well, anyway well thank you for that peter that's uh, very interesting uh, the balonic poltergeist is, is it do people generally know it's the balonic poltergeist or are you just using that name or do we would we if we wanted to look up more information about it would we look up the maxwell park poltergeist what what would we do um well I think if you look at, um, it's not solely known as the Maxwell Park. In fact, that, that's, as I say, misleading. Um, if a, look, a book just published in, I think, 2013 uh, by uh, Jeff Holder uh, is called yeah. Poltergeist Over Scotland. And it's, it, it contains a, it, it's a survey of a whole range of poltergeist cases in Scotland. And I'd say it's a very good book. Um, and uh, that certainly there, it's, it's, it's described correctly. And Holder has decoded the pseudonyms um, and cited lots of sources. In fact, that's, he's tapped into some sources. I'm not. I haven't even tapped into myself. Well, that's that's great. Well, Jeff Holder, we've had him on the Spooky Owls a, a number of times, writing for us and uh, uh, interviewed him. So we'll, we'll definitely have to go and have a look at that book and find out a little bit more about this. So anyway, thank you for that, Peter, uh, telling us about a, a poltergeist case that we didn't know about. Uh, it seems very similar to Enfield. So just shows you that uh, uh, the paranormal is pretty much the same all over the place. Anyway, you have a you have a great evening, and we'll talk to you next time. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>